Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. One of the most frequent comments that I get are requests for me to review things that are not related to retro handhelds. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think people just really appreciate that attention to detail that I bring to reviews. And honestly, I kind of like the idea as well. I love retro handhelds, but I need a break every once in a while too. So over the next month, I do have a couple ideas planned and today is gonna be the first one of those. This is gonna be a keyboard. We have the Retro Mechanical Keyboard from 8-Bit Doe. Now this is very gaming related. Obviously you can play games on it and it's also modeled after the original NES. It also has these two hotkeys, A and B, and also these bigger buttons that we'll test out later. And I think that's actually gonna work out really well when it comes to emulation. Now, I don't know a ton about keyboards. I have a few, but honestly, I just know when I like something and I don't really understand why. In this video here, we're gonna kind of learn about that process together while using this one here as the example. And so we're gonna explore some other options besides just gaming. For example, what it's like to just type on this keyboard and how it is gonna work in an everyday scenario. So I think we're gonna have a lot of fun and both you and I might learn something along the way. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and try it out. All right, to start, we're gonna go over the specs. Number one, this keyboard has 87 different keys and has a feature called N key rollover. Essentially, this means that if you press multiple keys at once, they will all register within the software each individually. Now, keyboard keys are made up of two different components. We have the switch and then the cap. And the switch is the mechanism that when pressed down provides the signal to the PCB that a key has been pressed. And the brand that we have within this keyboard is called Kale Box White version two. And Kale is a well-known brand when it comes to custom main mechanical keyboards. And there's a couple other brands you may have heard of, for example, Gatoron, as well as Cherry. Now the big thing about keyboard switches is they're always labeled with a color. And these white Kale switches are generally an equivalent to blue switches with other manufacturers. Now I'm definitely not smart enough to understand all these measurements we're seeing here in this table, but my understanding is that these white switches, along with the blue switches you will find from other manufacturers, are labeled as being clicky. And this is usually associated with actual typing, so they call this more of a typist style. Now one thing about these switches is that they are hot swappable, so if you want to switch them out for a different color, you can buy them and then do it yourself. And as a quick explanation, the brown switches are usually called tactile switches. These also are very similar to the white or blue switches that we were just talking about, but they don't have that physical clicky sound when you press down on them. Instead, this is often described as being more of a bump kind of feel. And finally, the red switches are what they call linear switches. This means they're gonna be more quiet and slide a little bit more. And generally, the red and brown switches are the ones that are more associated with gaming. And that's because they have a little bit less resistance than the clicky white or blue ones. Anyway, that's a super quick rundown of these switches. We'll do actual sound tests later in the video. Now there's a few things to understand when it comes to the caps. Number one, the type of plastic is called PBT. This is generally the more expensive type of plastic compared to ABS. And the thing about PBT is that they are less likely to get worn down. So if you've ever seen a keyboard that has like shiny keys on certain ones because they've been used a lot, that generally won't happen as much with PBT. Additionally, the labels on the caps are using a process called dye sublimation. And the idea here is they use a really high heat to have the actual label absorbed into the keycap. This means it's gonna be more resilient to wear and the labels won't rub off over time. And then finally, the other point about the caps is it's using what they call an MDA profile. And this really refers to the shape and the height of the keys and these are relatively short when it comes to full-size keys. Another thing that people focus on when it comes to keyboards is the mount and case itself. For this keyboard, we're using a plastic shell and it's using a top mount method. And that refers to how the PCB is inserted into the keyboard case. Now, because this is a plastic case, they also added an aluminum plate at the bottom. And that's to give the keyboard a very solid feel and a little bit of weight to make sure it stays in place. Now, in terms of battery, we're looking at 2000 milliamp hours. According to 8 Doe, this should last you about 200 hours. Now, I haven't had the keyboard long enough to actually test this myself, but they are using what they call low energy Bluetooth for their connectivity. This should give us some really long battery life, so 200 hours is probably pretty accurate. Now, in terms of weight, this is just over a kilogram or about 2.31 pounds. To me, given the size of the keyboard, it actually feels a little bit lightweight, but still very solid. Now, in terms of connectivity, like I mentioned, we do have Bluetooth, but then there's also a 2.4 gigahertz USB dongle. In addition, if you'd like, you can also use this as a wired keyboard. Now, Apido is providing their own software suite for customization within the keyboard, but unfortunately, as of making this review, it wasn't available for the public just yet. However, it does look like you will have some pretty standard Ultimate software options. So, for example, we should be able to map any of the keys however we would like, 
and you should also be able to program in macro functions here on the computer as well. And finally, let's talk about compatibility. So Apido says it's going to work with Windows 10 and above, and same thing with Android 9 or greater. Now in my testing, I found it also worked just fine in macOS, either with Bluetooth or with a 2.4 GHz dongle. However, the main issue for Mac users is going to be the Windows keys. If you look to the left of the spacebar, you can see we have Windows and Alt keys right here. However, with a Mac setup, these are swapped, so you'll have an Option and Command button instead. And this may be confusing for Mac users like myself when you have muscle memory for those specific locations. Now, I fully expect this to be mappable once we have the Ultimate software, so it's kind of a moot point right now. Either way, I did want to bring this up because I do think this will be just fine for Mac users. In fact, even the volume knob works perfectly fine within Mac OS. Okay, in terms of overall design, we actually have two options available. One is called the N Edition, which is obviously modeled after the NES, and that's the one we're reviewing here today. They're also offering one called the FC Edition. This is modeled after the Japanese Famicom. And one neat thing here is they've included the hiragana keyboard labels as well. However, other than the coloring as well as the hiragana labels, there is no difference between these two. And I think honestly, they both look really good. I kind of wish that I had both. Now, in terms of pricing, these keyboards cost $100. That's pretty expensive considering the fact that you can get much cheaper keyboards on Amazon, but just bear in mind that you kind of get what you pay for, and so these are a little bit more on the higher end. Now, let's move over to the unboxing. 8 did send this one out for me to review. Either way, all opinions are my own, and they're not seeing this video ahead of time, and no money was exchanged in any way. Okay, inside the box, in addition to the keyboard, we're going to get a couple different labeling cards. The first is going to show us how to map our hotkeys. We'll go into this later in the video. On the back side, it also shows you a few of the functions that you could set for hotkeys. In addition, they provide some stickers in case you wanted to put these on their super buttons, which we'll talk about here in a moment. They also have an instruction manual. It's a little bit brief. It mostly just goes over labels for each of the keys, as well as how to get it all connected. Inside, we also have a USB cable. This is going to be to both charge the keyboard, as well as if you want to use it in a wired state. And then finally, we have the most unique property of this entire keyboard, and this is what they're calling super buttons. Essentially, these are two programmable hotkey buttons that you can plug directly into the keyboard. And these can be used to mimic any of the keys that are already on the keyboard, including a combination of multiple keys at once. And I've got a couple of first impressions here. Number one is that they are just comically large, but super satisfying to actually press down on. In fact, I feel like I could press down on these all day. It's just a really satisfying experience. Now, at first, I was a little bit confused at what these buttons actually were in terms of the mechanical function. But it is pretty easy to pull the top right off, and it actually uses the exact same switch and cap function as the other keys. Now, the switch itself is green, and I'm not sure if this is a Kale switch or someone else's. But generally, a green switch is associated with a tactile response, but with a little bit more force. And honestly, to my untrained fingers, I can't really tell the difference between the keys themselves and these super buttons. Either way, they are very satisfying to press down on and do have a bit of a tactile feel. And just as a note here, the casing itself is made out of metal. It's nice and solid. And the entire bottom is made of rubber. And so this is going to feel pretty sturdy on a table, even if you try to move it around. All right, now let's take a look at the keyboard itself and get some first impressions. The first thing that struck me is that this thing looks very old and vintage. In fact, it reminds me a lot of one of my very first computers, the Commodore 64. The other thing that caught my eye right off the bat is the fact that it doesn't have a numeric keypad. Anyway, in terms of the actual keys themselves, yes, this is very tactile and clicky. And honestly, I think that's a pretty good fit for this style of keyboard. It has a very retro look and is a little bit elevated. And so to me, it just screams very 1980s or 1990s typist. And so in that regard, I really think that they nailed both the feel and the look of this keyboard. Now, personally, I do not usually use a keyboard that has this high of a profile just because it will hurt my wrists over time. So if you are someone who prefers a low profile keyboard like me and you want to get something like this, you will probably have to get a wrist rest. Next, I want to talk about the labels themselves. Now, the alphabetic keys seem to have a little bit more of a rounded font, but it still does have a distinct squarish kind of feel. Now, if you look at the function keys, these have a little bit different of a font. This seems to be a lot more blocky. Now, personally, I don't think this bothers me at all, but I do kind of wish that this blocky font was also used with the alphabetic keys because I like it a lot. Now, up top on the left, we have our power and connection toggle. And here you can switch between the off position as well as 2.4 gigahertz or Bluetooth. Now, to the right of that, we have our volume knob. A couple notes about this one. Number one, this spins freely. So it's not like it starts at zero at the bottom and then goes to 100%. You can just kind of spin this over and over. And in addition, this is not a smooth knob. It will click as you cycle it around. So when you have it connected to a computer like I have here, when you use that volume knob, it's going to go up and down in increments of four. 
Okay, next we have three different function or menu buttons. The leftmost one is our connection button, and then to the right of that we have our mapping button. We'll use this extensively later in the video. And finally, the button to the right with the 8 logo is for different profiles. Now this is gonna need to be set up in the Ultimate software, which unfortunately I don't have access to, but I think this is gonna be really handy, especially if you're trying to swap between Windows and Mac PCs. For example, you can have the Windows profile so that all the keys will work out just fine, but then you could also switch over to the Mac profile if you wanted to swap the Windows and Alt keys. And also if you had specific hotkeys for certain games, you could make specific profiles for those as well. Now to the right of these buttons, we have this label that has a very NES feel to it. I was kind of hoping that the ribbed section here more towards the right was actually ribbed, but no, this is completely flat. So this is just something that's been printed on. On the top right, we have two light indicators for both caps lock and scroll lock. And then finally, we have our power LED. This one's pretty neat. As soon as you turn it on, it's gonna turn red, and it has a very nostalgic look to it, as you can see. Below that, we have our typical 75% function keys. And then at the very bottom, we also have our arrow keys. Now, also on the right side, we do have A and B hotkeys. And as I'll show later, these can also be programmed for macro functions. Next, I wanna take a little bit more in-depth look at the keys themselves. And first thing to know is that pulling off the caps here is extremely easy. On other keyboards, you often will have to use a tool, but not so much with this one. And underneath, we can see one of those white box switches. Now, like I mentioned before, these switches are hot swappable, so if you want to change them out, you can. But bear in mind that that will usually require a tool, which does not come with this 8 keyboard. Okay, next we'll go around the keyboard, starting with the sides. Now, as you can see, there's not a lot going on here, but I did want to mention that the feel of the plastic here is super retro as well. It definitely has a more textured feel, and I really like it. Now, let's look at the back and the I.O. On the left, we have four different 3.5 millimeter headphone jacks, and each of these will be a connector for one of those super button paddles. In the center of the keyboard, we have our USB port. This is gonna be used for both charging as well as connectivity. And then to the right of that, we have our 2.4 gigahertz USB dongle. Now this dongle is very typical of other controllers that are available from 8 Do, And the idea here is you just have to plug this into your computer and you don't have to do any sort of connection. It's essentially gonna work like a wired keyboard, but over wireless protocol. One of the things I did notice about this one in particular is that it has a magnetic connection, which is very satisfying to pull in and out. I've got a few different products that use 2.4 gigahertz dongles like this, but this is the first time I've seen one that's magnetic. It's really kind of neat. Next, let's take a look at the bottom. At each corner, we have these rubber feet, and they seem pretty flush with the keyboard itself, and I was a little worried that it wasn't gonna work very well in terms of stabilizing the keyboard. However, it turns out that they do work fine. After all, this is a pretty heavyweight keyboard, being about 2.3 pounds, and I think the addition of these rubber feet do help to hold it in place. Next, I wanna do a quick sound test of the keys. Now, I don't have equipment set up to actually record this really well, but I think this will give you a pretty good idea of how everything will sound. Next, I want to compare it to another mechanical keyboard. This is the Keychron C1. This one is using brown switches, which means it should be pretty similar to the white or blue ones that we were just using. These one will not have a clicky tactile sound. Next, I want to test out my main keyboard. This one is called the Nufi Air 75. I've been using this for about a year now. And this is a low profile mechanical keyboard using red switches. And the reason why I use this one the most is because it is low profile and makes it easy on my wrists. Now, one of the things I do like about this keyboard is that it does have backlit RGB lighting. And it's pretty easy to cycle through these. You just press the function button and then left and right on the keypad. However, because it is RGB lit like this, the battery life on this is pretty terrible. I have to charge this up about once a week. Now let's do a quick size comparison between these two. As you can see, the Air 75 is much smaller and more compact. But honestly, I don't really think that's the purpose or the design of the 8 Do keyboard anyway. Instead, the 8 Do one to me conveys a more retro feel, and so it kind of makes sense given the fact that they call it a retro keyboard. Now, this is my usual studio setup. I will connect it via Bluetooth to both my Mac and Windows PC. And because it's wireless, I do have to charge it up about once a week. 
By contrast, here is the 8-bit dough controller. Honestly, I still think it fits in pretty well with my desk here. I was expecting it to take up a lot more room, but I still think this is actually pretty reasonable. Now this is super subjective and I'm not sure how much desk space you have and mine is a relatively large desk. Next, we're gonna do a couple other tests that are on the more subjective side. We're gonna start with a typing test. I just pulled up typingtest.com and I'm running through a medium difficulty test. I'm not the best typist in the world, but I did take a couple classes back in the day. Either way, as you can see here, I got 68 words per minute. That's not too bad and I did make a couple mistakes that I had to go back and delete. Now this is super unfair, but I'm also gonna do a typing test with my Air 75. The reason why this is so unfair is because I've been using this specific keyboard for a year at this point. Either way, I was surprised to find that my results were not much better. It was only 72 words per minute. Now when it comes to the actual feel of using the 8-bit dough keyboard to do some typing, it actually is very satisfying. I do really like these white switches. I had actually avoided them with my other keyboards because I thought they would be too loud. But honestly, the click is not too bad and it's super satisfying to actually use. However, if I was going to use this for a prolonged period, I definitely would get something to rest my wrists on. But other than that, I really enjoyed myself typing on this keyboard. Next, let's do a little bit of keyboard and mouse gaming. First thing I have to admit is that I never play with a keyboard and mouse like this. It feels very unnatural to me. So I am a terrible judge at how this is going to work when it comes to gaming. However, I will say that due to the clicky nature of these switches, it's probably not going to be ideal for gaming, especially if you're trying to do something competitively. I think there's a reason why people use the red and brown switches instead, because they're much more fast to press down on. So this is probably not going to be a great fit specifically for competitive gaming, but if you like to play keyboard and mouse games that aren't super intense, this will probably be just fine. Next, we're going to mess around with the hotkeys. This is one of the coolest components of the whole keyboard. Now on their own, they won't be mapped to anything, so they're not going to work at all. But setting this up is pretty easy. All you have to do is just tap on that star button for about half a second. And once the light starts going, then you want to press on whatever keys you want to have mapped to it, as well as either the A or B key, whatever you want to have recorded. After you're pressing all of them, you can go ahead and lift your fingers up, and the light will go out, meaning that it's been recorded. Now pressing Windows D is going to toggle showing the desktop. And so now I've basically transformed that into one key. If I press the A button, you can see that it's bringing up my document up and down. And that's really about it when it comes to the hotkeys here on the keyboard. Next, I want to try out these super buttons. And setting this up is super easy. You just plug it into one of those 3.5 millimeter jacks. Now, initially, I thought that the A and B here would mimic the A and B on the keyboard, but it turns out that they are actually independent. So pressing the A button here will not bring up my desktop. Instead, I'll have to program these independently, and it's the exact same process. So I'm going to tap on that star button, then whatever keys I want to have recorded, and then press the A button. And I'm just going to use that Windows D function again, but now you can see that yes is working fine. So this is actually pretty exciting to me, because instead of having just two different function buttons, when you plug in the super button, you will actually have four. You'll have the two on the keyboard, but then also the two on the super buttons themselves. So that actually kind of doubles the functionality that I was expecting to have with this keyboard. Now let's actually try out the super buttons in a real life scenario. I'm going to go into RetroArch and set up hotkeys specific to this situation. My hotkey enable button is going to be the shift key. And then what I'm going to do is set these up as my save and load states. So for each of these functions, I've set them up as the number one and number two keys on the keyboard. So now let's go ahead and map that to our super buttons. First thing I'm going to do is clear my hotkeys by holding onto the star button for about five seconds. Now I'm ready to pair. I'm going to press the star key and then shift and two and then press the A button. This means that the save state function is now going to be mapped to the button A. Along those same lines, we're going to use shift and one associated with the button B. This is going to be our load state function. So now let's go ahead and test this out while actually playing a game. We're going to play Tecmo Super Bowl on the NES. This is a game I've been playing since the early 90s when it first released. And to this day, it's probably still one of my most played NES games overall. So you're probably wondering why I'm going to use a save state and a load state with this game in particular. The thing is with this game is that when I play it, I love to cheat. I love to basically beat the computer 99 to 0. And the way I do that is by using save and load states. So for example, if I'm about to pick a play, what I will do is I'll save my state right before then. From there, I'm going to pick my play, and if it doesn't go the way I want, then I can immediately load it right back to where I was. Now I'm playing as the 49ers, and I'm passing from Joe Montana to Jerry Rice, so of course he's going to catch the ball because he is completely overpowered. But all the same, if it hadn't worked out the way I wanted to, I could go ahead and press the B button, and it'll load right back up to where I was. Now of course you can always just map these hotkeys directly onto your controller, but there's something really fun about having a dedicated a button specifically to saving and loading a state. And of course there are many other ways that you could use this within emulation. For example, you could have one of them work as a fast forward and the other one work as a rewind. 
But for me personally, I think this will work really well with the save and load state concept, especially if you're a speedrunner and you don't want to be bothered with having to memorize any hotkeys. Now, as much as I love these super buttons, there is one thing that is kind of annoying to me. And it's really the fact that we have this cable coupled with the fact that the connection is the back of the keyboard. What I found is when setting this up, I didn't really have any place that I could lay out this cable. And for me personally, I like having a very clean desktop setup. And so in that regard, it just didn't feel as clean as I was really hoping it would be. I tried a couple different things like hiding the cable a little bit better, but honestly, it still was a little bit annoying to me. So honestly, I don't think this is something that I would keep permanently on my desk just because of these cables that are kind of all over the place. If anything, I think I would have preferred to have one of the 3.5mm jacks at the front of the keyboard. That way I could have easily plugged it in when I needed it and then unplugged it when I wanted to have it out of sight. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here. I bet you didn't expect I could make a keyboard review this long. But let's go ahead and start wrapping up talking about the things I like and don't like about this 8 mechanical keyboard. Number one, this thing is so nostalgic. I mean, after all, the NES is my favorite console of all time. And I also played on keyboards very similar to this back in the 80s and 90s. But in addition to looking good, I think this keyboard also feels very good. I was a little bit hesitant to try out these white box keys just because I didn't think I would like it being so clicky, but it turns out that I really like these switches. In addition, I like the fact that we have multiple connectivity options, both Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz and wired if you wanted as well. I also love the A and B hotkeys, both on the keyboard as well as those super buttons. And it kind of feels like a bonus the fact that the A and B buttons are independent of one another. So as it stands, we're kind of getting four buttons for the price of two. I also appreciate the fact that this keyboard is fully customizable with all of the mechanical keyboard standards. That means if somebody wants to really curate this to make it their own, they have a really nice baseline to work with. This is a similar thing that we saw with the 8 bit arcade stick, which was also very customizable. And I think that for everything that we're getting here, a $99 retail price is pretty great, especially when you start looking into mechanical keyboards. This is a great entry price in case you want to get your feet wet before spending hundreds of dollars on something a little bit more crazy. Now, of course, nothing is perfect, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the things I didn't like about this keyboard. Number one is kind of a like and dislike in the fact that I like the fact that it does work with Mac, but I think it would have been pretty easy for 8 to include Mac keycaps. This would have made it very easy to swap out those keys in case you wanted to make this a Mac-centric keyboard. A lot of the other keyboard manufacturers do provide those options. The other thing I didn't like was the kind of unwieldy cord that comes with these super buttons. Now, I'm not really blaming them because I don't think they could have actually made it wireless without increasing the price, but all the same, for someone who likes to have a very clean desktop setup, it's something that I probably won't use very often. And finally, another nitpick I have, and this really didn't bother me that much, is the fact that it lacks a numeric keypad. I've seen a lot of comments from others where they said they really wish they had that because they can't live without it. Now, personally, I only really wish for a numeric keypad when I'm like doing my taxes, and so I've just kind of adapted without it. Either way, that might be something that is important to you, so I did want to bring it up. Now in the end, I do recommend this keyboard. I think there's a lot of things going well for it and you get a lot of functionality and quality for the price. Now that being said, if you're the kind of person who doesn't want to spend $99 on a keyboard, then this might not be the best fit for you. But if you are interested in getting a mechanical keyboard and you don't want to break the bank, or if you want something that's very nostalgic and looks good on your desk, then I think we have a winner right here. And I'm still kind of torn about the super buttons. This was probably my biggest surprise of this whole endeavor. And so I really am looking forward to using it. I just need to find a better place to put it. Anyway, that's about it for this video here. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you going to pick one of these up or not and why? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.